<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Thank you for coming to a voiceless talk. I'm sorry, I lost my voice. I'll, if anyone finds it, please. Um, my name is Jean-Paul Jacob. Welcome to Cube in the Future, which is a presentation about scenarios for the future. I am a research emeritus at IBM. For those of you who forgot your Latin, emeritus means retired and old, but not dead yet. I have the same position at UC Berkeley, where I actually spend most of my time. So those of you from UC Berkeley, welcome to this talk. I've been with IBM many years. In fact, I joined IBM at age 25. And today, I'm 76, so I've been 51 years with IBM. <laughs> and in case any of you have some ideas of saying the long look, look at what may happen to you. Um, I subscribe to the Geneva Convention for truth in presenting. So I have to tell you the truth. And part of the truth <coughs> is that I take a medicine. It's called Corag or Carve de Law, Carve de Law for heart. The interesting thing about this medicine is that it has many side effects. Like it has more side effects than good. <laughs> so these are some of the side effects which are listed actually in the warnings about the medicine. And one of interest here is that it causes confusion. <laughs> so if by any chance you don't understand what I'm saying, don't blame me, blame Coreg. The other interesting aspect is that Coreg has both an input and output effect. So I'm sure this talk is not going to go beyond 3 p.m. because I'm drinking water with my medicine. For these 51 years I've been with IBM, my job has been, among other things, to look at the future, try to predict scenarios technologies and things that may happen to all of us in the future. I've done that for 51 years. IBM gives us all the tools we need to do our job. And this is the only tool they gave me. <laughs> Unfortunately, this tool is not very good. I made all kinds of wrong predictions, so I decided to abandon the crystal cube. And instead, I adopted sorry, the crystal ball, and instead I adopted the crystal. Now the crystal cube is different from the crystal ball because it allows us to look at the future or technologies or innovations that one proposes under six different facets, the faces of the cube. We ask six questions about a scenario or a technology in order to try to see if it's feasible. And the six questions are questions that make sense to most people, but we don't think of them so much in isolated form. They are, specifically, what do people want? And that's the most important question, usually, for most people trying to build innovation or new technologies or have ideas of future scenarios. What do people really want? And today we have a slew of possibilities in determining what people want because of social networks, of Twitter, of YouTube, of um, Facebook, etc. But as important to what people want is with what we are proposing, are we addressing a challenge, a recognized challenge? Are we solving a problem? Which problem? Who has that problem? And why do we think we are solving? Usually we think of the future in terms of some years ahead. <coughs> and if we think of the future and create a scenario, we have to ask ourselves the question, is the technology that we need at that time going to be available? Which is the technology outlook for the future? How we determine which technologies will be available when? The three red ones, the red background questions, are the most commonly asked questions, but not the most important. The most important are on the dark side of the cube. They're here in black, in blue background. They are laws and regulations. Are there laws and regulations that prevent us from doing what we want? For example, if I invent a jetpack so I can fly from here around, is that a law that say you cannot fly 
with a jetpack in Almaden Valley? And if so, what do we do to change the law? The when question is very important. When do we want this or when do we believe that our idea is going to take effect? And finally, our idea, the great ideas, have to be very simple, like magic. Magic consists of a very simple idea that has a tremendous effect. And the ideal invention, innovation, idea, technology is one which is very simple, I'll give you an example, but have a tremendous effect. The three most popular ones are in fact the ones that IBM have used in its campaign called A Smarter Planet. All kinds of scenarios that we see for the future correspond to the answers to what people want, which challenges this technology or this scenario address, and which is the technology outlook for the future. However, like I mentioned to you, the blue background questions are very important. When? If you miss the when you want to announce, you may miss in a big deal. IBM has about 50 that I've counted. Brilliant mistakes. There were brilliant ideas that turned out to be a mistake. Here is one. If you look in Wikipedia, the first smartphone which had an operating system, a touch screen, was created 20 years ago by IBM. Nobody wanted to buy it. It was too early. People didn't even believe in cell phones 20 years ago. But if you go to Wikipedia and look for the Simon phone, you can see IBM created the smartphone. It was too early. Brilliant idea, but too early. The opposite can also be true. In this laboratory, 50 yards from here, a gentleman called Ted Codd invented a new way of organizing data in databases called relational databases. A gentleman north of us read the paper by Ted Codd and created a company. Inspired by the IBM research paper, he started Oracle. His name is Larry Ellison. And IBM did not change its own method of managing databases until much later when it adopted relational databases, but definitely it was too late for the big business. 50 yards from here, we also invented something in 1996 in the user group that I'm pointing to. Tom Zimmerman invented something called the personal area network. He observed that the blood conducts electricity. Weak signals that it don't even feel can transit through your body, creating a network in your body. And if you go to Google and look at IBM Personal Area Network, you get 175,000 results. It was a big deal. By creating that Personal Area Network, you could put information, which you did, in the shoe, in your shoe, on the sole of your shoe. And then information travels through your body. And when you touch fingers with somebody else, the information will go to somebody else. And here on the screen, you see information, whose, which is the business card for Tom Zimmerman. So you could transmit signals through the body. It gave a whole new interpretation to the subway in New York, where people rub against you all the time. <laughs> all they want is data. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. OK, so there are many ways of transmitting data by touching. Here is a little more aggressive one. <laughs> and. By kissing, you can transmit data. That's the origin of the expression, kiss and tell. <laughs> so what you're seeing here are two people exchanging data. Lots of data, big data. In this talk, we are going to create many scenarios like that. Some feasible, some impossible. But what I want to tell you, first of all, is that this talk is rated R. Be prepared. R, of course, is for research. I'm going to cover only research ideas, not development ideas. So here are the six faces of the cube that I use to look into the future. Let's go face by face and see which scenarios could exist and what do those questions mean. So let's start by what people want. And I'll spend 30 to 40% of my time in this item. What do people want? To know what people want today is very easy. You have a zillion sources. You have the blogs, 
you have tweets, you have opinion surveys, you have wikis, you have uh, YouTube, you have Jam. IBM is very good in Jam. But one thing we know that people like you don't want. You don't want to suffer from nomophobia. You don't want to suffer from nomophobia. So I ask you, who among you has nomophobia? One person raised his hand. The other is not they don't have a nomophobia. It's because they don't know what nomophobia is. <laughs> so nomophobia is a new term. It's the fear of being separated <coughs> from your cell phone. <laughs> there are today's, there are shrinks that specialize in nomophobia because lots of people have this awful fear of being separated from their cell phone given that this is a very common disease and that we have for a long time invented the idea of a leash to hold a dog close to us. Why not create a leash for our cell phone? But of course, we are in the digital area. What I predict is that in the future, we're going to have so-called cell phone electronic leash, which actually could be the personal area network. When your cell phone separates from you, something is going to happen so you know your cell phone is away from you. And there is already one such product called ZOM, Z-O-M-M, and others will come up. What do people want? If you look at the right lower corner, you see Innovation Jam. IBM has been conducting for 10 years jams in which people from universities, customers, and even all internal jams give their opinion on a number of topics. IBM has even a program office for jams. We sell the technology of conducting a jam. The latest jam we conducted, those of you who are with IBM, was conducted in March of this year, and it was called the Client Experience Jam. About 250,000 people logged into this jam, which lasted for three days, and there were 100,000 comments, ideas, and stories. And the results will be out next week, but in reading those, the content of those jams, I already can tell you that people have discovered that nowadays clients of any company don't go for the word of the marketing person of the supplier. They go to social networks, they go to blogs, they go to wikis, they ask other people. That's the new way of the doing marketing. You don't sell to anyone. They will buy what they want. You have to influence how that goes. Gems are part of this collective way of discovering what people want. But in this laboratory, we also have a department 50 yards from here. It's called the user department. And they bridge the gap between what collectively people want and what individuals want. They specialize in trying to analyze what individuals want. If you want to know what people want, you may analyze all the tweets that are on the, top, on the topic. But if you want to all know what a person wants, you should analyze all the tweets and all the uh, information in Facebook, et cetera, that that person has posted. So they have developed, they are developing a system called System U, 50 yards from here. And the idea of System U is to do a modeling of the psychological, cognitive, and behavior characteristics of an individual and one of a group of individuals of the whole group. So what do people want? Have you ever felt tired at work? Do you want? Yes, right now, yes. <laughs> you want a nap? Yes, right now, yes. When do you go for a nap? The lights here. I used to talk with the lights lower so that you could sleep, but I learned my lesson. So when do you go for a nap? And the answer is very easy. Go to Google. Because Google up in the peninsula has this nap pod. Do you know that? You can take a nap. Is this a good idea to have at work a nap pod that is acoustically insulated? You can hear your music or whatever you want. You can hear the talk if that puts you to sleep and have a nice nap. Do people here at Albaden want nap pods like Google? To know that, 
we could ask everybody. But instead of asking, do you want a nap pod, we changed the question around and created this year, about five months ago, a program called Archangels. ARC stands for Amadan Research Center. Archangels is a program in which each person in Amadan was given $500, hypothetical, fictitious, not in cash, <laughs> in a bank account. And then people could propose projects, projects of the type, you know, I want to have a garden where people can plant their own organic vegetables. Projects of the type, everybody should learn about this new technology up and coming for 3D printing. So over 30 projects were proposed. People could comment, give feedback, and then each person in this building could allocate part or all of its $500 to one or more projects. This pledging of money and volunteering to do work went from February 15th to March 22nd. And again, there were over 30 projects, one of which, by the way, was this nap pod that Google has. But the winning project is sitting to my left, and the person who proposed was on the screen. The winning project is a telepresence robot, a robot that allows people who are far away to navigate in a building and attend any talk, any meeting they want. That's called a beam robot, and the person who was there talking to me, Eben Haber, he's now in Canada, he's manipulating the robot from Canada, he's present here through his robot. This was the winning of the 260 people that voted, 72 people supported this telepresence or remote presence robot. So that's what people want. What else people want? There is one thing that through all this media we have concluded people want. People don't want to have to learn about computers. People don't want to become computer literate. People want computers to become people literate. Learn, understand, communicate with us the way we do with each other. That's what people want. But computers are not like that yet, except for one, presenting IBM Watson's computer. It's a computer that played Jeopardy. Some of you saw the game two years ago on television and beat the best players in the world. IBM Watson <coughs> was the subject of a Nova TV program, considered the smartest machine on Earth. It does a number of things which are extremely smart because communication is never easy. You have to interpret a sentence according to the context to what already happened, to who you are, who's saying the sentence, etc. Very smart machine. Here's a short bio of Watson. Was Watson was born in 2007 in our research lab in Yorktown, New York, out of IBM research parents. The people who created Watson Describe Watson as good looking, that's true. Excellent memory. One quintillion characters. That's lots. Millions and millions of books, documents, publications, encyclopedias. Runs extremely fast because it runs thousands of threads in parallel. Likes to play, it plays Jeopardy. Studies lots. Watson's always reading. At this time, it's reading about a million books a second. It can multitask and only speaks, only gives an answer to a question when it is confident. It even tells you the degree of confidence. Watson was the computer that won the final Jeopardy game with the two best players ever to play the game. But Watson is going much further. If you ask Watson, who are you? Watson say he likes to read, learn, hypothesize, and recommend much beyond what the game would be. In fact, what Watson wants to do, according to this caption here, is exactly what the psychoanalyst does. So Watson could become a psychoanalyst and it's not out of the question. Watson has lots of potential business application in healthcare <coughs> and life sciences because it has studied millions of documents, books in medicine, how certain patients were treated 
for some symptoms. What symptoms mean and so forth, Watson is very good. In fact, it has helped the Cleveland Clinic diagnostic of cancer. It's now going beyond that and dedicating itself to customer service, understanding what any business is and answering questions from service such as a help desk or a call center would do. This headline from USA Today, IBM Watson conquered jeopardy. Cancer, it really did not con conquer cancer, but one form of cancer, and now it's going after customer service. Last week, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, IBM announced a new product called the IBM Watson Engagement Advisor, which as part of it has a site called Ask Watson. You can go and ask Watson any question. Watson will consult those zillions of documents you have read, work its magic in parallel, lots of threads, asking questions to see if your question may have many answers, and answer with the degree of confidence that it has in the answer, to tell you which degree of confidence it has. Today, a beginning of that exists in Siri, which is in the Apple iPhone. You can ask Siri a question. But Siri is very limited. It doesn't really study millions of documents. It has a database, and usually it just repeats the question to you or use some information, which is very limited. So if you reinterpret the word Siri for Sir I, well, I predicted that today we have Sir I, but in 2015, we're going to have Sir Watson answering much broader questions for you. Watson understands not spoken language yet, but written natural language. It's extremely difficult to understand natural language. It has no logic. Would you believe that we talk and we have no logic? I know you are listening to this talk, so you've seen a proof of it. There is no logic when we talk. In fact, logic would lead us to the wrong conclusion. Look at the sentence. What do logic tell you? <laughs> Where do you get baby oil? You have to squeeze a baby. Don't do that at all. <laughs> we have to think, when we think of a new technology or a new idea, of which challenges are being addressed. Now, it has to be a recognized challenge by a group, a small group, a large group, a state, a country, or humanity. But you must be able to say, I'm helping solve this problem or face this challenge. Challenges come in all colors and ways. So in different groups, different size groups, or states, or countries, or humani humanity, challenges are, you can see a pink dot will appear. What I'm saying is uh, challenges are in healthcare, that's worldwide, traffic, worldwide problems, education, worldwide, getting to be very expensive, consumption of energy, worldwide, Pollution worldwide, flooding, many countries, many continents, crime, cities, states, even parts of the city, energy distribution, drinkable water, huge problem. We're going to run out of drinkable water very soon. Drought, many regions of the world. Migration to the cities, a major problem that very few people realize is going to hit us very soon. The rural population is migrating continuously to cities whose populations are growing. But that's not only the city problem. The problem is that the rural population produced all the food we ate. And now, who's going to produce our food? I'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, big data, major challenge. We are being absolutely flooded by data these days at a rate which is incredible, increasing, and inimaginable. It is a big problem, and you all have heard of big data. So what is big data? How do you deal with big data? Why did it suddenly explode in the scene? All my knowledge of big data come from a very good book, which seems to have been written exactly for people like me. You can go buy lots of books on the web, watch, and see your big data. The fact is that big data is a, 
universal problem, which we are tackling here at Almaden. This is the Almaden library. So take our library, for example. And I really mean, please take the library. We don't want books anymore. In fact, you are a little too late because people already took the library. The library of Almaden, 50 yards from here, has disappeared. And today, the, lab, the library has been replaced by a space called the Accelerated Discovery Lab, which is a new way for us to discuss in forums, <coughs> big, <coughs> sorry, big data, big data and analytics. Must be very irritating to be among the public listening to this guy struggling to talk. Um, the Accelerated Discovery Lab is the name of this place where we study in collective forums, big data and analytics. Very difficult name to remember, Accelerated Discovery Lab. So I took the first letters of each word and I came up with the word Agdila. Is that easier to remember? Not so much easier to remember Agdila unless you associate Agdila with something. So I created a monster which is part of a cartoon. The cartoon has a monster called Agdila and it likes to eat big data. So remember Agdila, the big data eater. So where does all this big data come from? And what can we do about it? It comes from everywhere, like I told you. Just YouTube, which is a little thing compared to Facebook and Twitter. Three billion hours of video. I watch every month on YouTube. So these videos come digitally to you. Many of you, <coughs> many of you store these videos. YouTube is a tremendous source, but nothing compared to Facebook. In January of last year, not this year, YouTube had four billion views per day. Four billion views is like 160 views for each inhabitant uh, of the Earth that has a computer. It's mind-boggling, not to mention Facebook, which is immediately below YouTube, Facebook has perhaps one billion users entering data all the time. Half of the data entered in Facebook is by an IBM fellow in this lab. His name is Mohan. He's not here, right? No, only his son, okay. So what are we creating? How big is this big data? And the answer is we are creating every year one zettabyte of information. It's a huge number, 10 to the power 21. You say, what is that? It's 1,000 billion of billions. You say, still not very much. So let's give you an idea. One kilobyte, a thousand bytes, thousand characters. You can think of a byte as a character. One megabyte is a thousand kilobytes. One gigabyte is a thousand megabytes. One terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. One petabyte, a thousand terabytes. One exabyte, a thousand petabytes. And one zettabyte, a thousand exabytes. Still nothing. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't care for all the zeros, but where in the heck do people come with all those names? They all come from Old Greek, and they mean large, very large, extremely large. Oh my God, <laughs> how large can it get, etc. It is a very huge number. So we thought that information, information, bytes, whatever you ask, numbers, mean nothing. What means something is knowledge, what you extract from that information. So today, knowledge is the new currency. And you have heard, we live in a knowledge economy. Now, knowledge is extracted from information or bytes with a future. It can be a mathematical model, like weather forecasting, takes all kinds of data points on the weather 
and it gives you a very simple result. Is it going to rain or not tomorrow? So it's an information plus a future, mathematical, statistical, psychological, data mining, graphical, whatever filter it is. And more modernly, knowledge is the result of using analytics on big data to observe some things. So knowledge is the new currency. I myself deal in that currency. What I do is that I'm a merchant of knowledge. I buy and sell knowledge in the world info bazaar. And that is my number. <laughs> the face of big data. Big data is like big foot. Nobody ever saw it. However, I had a, ha a rare glimpse at big data. And this is the face of big data. It does look like a face, doesn't it? And it's not big foot, it's big data. In fact, what you're looking at is part of a map of the United States with all the wind speed directions and intensity. The darkness of a line is the intensity of the wind and the direction of the line is the direction of the wind. And in fact, what you're looking is a section of Northern California. You can see a red dot. The red dot is Berkeley. And in front of the red dot, you see the Bay Area. So this is not really a picture of big data. It's just a picture of the wind speed in Northern California. Technology outlook. If you're going to create a scenario that has something that you don't know yet will exist, you better have an idea whether it can come or not. So how do we know what technologies, which technologies are coming? How do we know what technology outlook is like? IDM puts together every year, and many of the people here from IDM have participated, something called a global technology outlook. It lists every year five or six major headings, and under those headings, the significant technology trends for the next three to 10 year horizon. There is an outside version you can find on the web and an internal ver version which we use internally as guideline. It is a major document and takes lots of people to prepare it and a consensus and so forth. And in fact, for the 2013 Global Technology Outlook, here are the six areas where it makes predictions for the next three to 10 years. I'd just like to point out, because most of you are students, this item, personalized education. This is not only IBM. Everybody sees this coming. The price of tuition, as you all know, is going up. The price of education is going up. And do you get personalized education? No, you get to go to a classroom with lots of other people that learn at different speeds and with different interests than you do. So what we see is a shift in learning, a shift from someone in front of a classroom to everybody participating in the learning process. So this idea of a classroom where a professor teaches and everybody learns what the professor is teaching, but no more, no less, no personalization, is changing, and very quickly, changing to what's called massive open online courses. Courses that you can take online, which you can progress at your own rate, and courses which are on video, given by the best faculty for that subject that one can find, or that money can buy. They are much cheaper, and instead of uh, 20 people in a classroom, you can have 100,000 people taking a course at the same time. Companies are coming right and left. In the Bay Area, we have Coursera, which was created at Stanford, but now involves like 20 universities. EDX is a consortium that was created by MIT and Harvard, and now includes Berkeley, and they're meeting others, so you can attend courses by those people. What happens here is that they have massification. Hundreds of thousands of people can take a course. The personalization that you can navigate in that course as you want. And to fulfill, again, that image that everybody's participating, 
There is some innovation in this type of teaching. At Berkeley, Professor Greg Niemeyer teaches a course in which the students can only take online. They never meet each other. But instead of his grading the students' papers, students themselves are grading the other students. Students themselves are asking questions of the other students. He's just a super monitor presenting statistics at the end of the course. So let students grade each other. Very interesting concept, innovative concept. There is another way of doing technology outlook, which is very well known. It would take a long time to go into detail, but it is a way that a consulting firm called Gartner uses. And the Gartner technology outlook is also called the Gartner hype curve. It's based on the fact that for every technology, if you look at expectations, vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, you find that as the technology triggers, expectations start going up until it reaches the top of expectation called the peak of inflated expectations. After that, it goes down too much. We expect it too much. It goes down into the valley of disillusionment. After we fall in the valley of disillusionment, we start becoming more real and we start climbing again in our expectation in what's called the slope of enlightenment, finally reaching the plateau of productivity for that technology. Gartner does that every year for hundreds of technologies. So get ready for a very busy curve. Here is the Gartner 2013 hype curve. What's interesting, and now I'm going to try to use my laser beam here, is not only where these points are in the curve, this is the peak of expectations, then the value of this delusement, disillusionment. The interesting part is the symbol that represents the technology, which at the bottom here <coughs> tells you in how many years the technology will go through this curve. Some technologies go very quickly through this curve, others very slowly. Here are the slowest ones, quantum computing. Very slow to take more than 10 years, according to Gardner, and I agree with them. When it is on the top of the expectation curve is 3D printing. Everybody here, I hope, knows about 3D printing. By the way, there is one in the building that Martin proposed as one of those Archangel projects. There is one at Berkeley, which is a kiosk. You can put your money and get a 3D object. 3D printing working by having a bath or something and you start pulling out of this bath the shape you want. But every time you start pulling, a laser is cutting the contour of what it wants to come out of that bath. So a laser keeps cutting the contours layer by layer and you build something, so to speak, by cutting layer by layer and pulling it together. The one that people hoped would work was bioprinting which here Gartner says would take 10 years or more. If you go to the TED talk, you can see people on stage printing artificial body parts, printing veins, printing circulatory uh, arteries, printing kidneys, etc. Are we ever going to be able to do that? Gartner thinks this will take a long time for us to print organ parts. Interesting is that one of the quickest applications of 3D printing is for dentists. Today when you go to a dentist and you need a tooth replaced by a bridge, a new tooth, the dentist takes a mold, sends it out, takes two weeks to get it back. Why not print it right there and then try the mold in your mouth? So here is 3D printing at the top and natural language question and answers is going very high in this curve. We still have lots that we expect to see from natural language question and answer. Okay, so much for the three most popular ways of looking at the future. But here come three perhaps even more important ways we should look. The first one is laws and regulations. Are there laws and regulations that allow us to do something 
or forbid us from doing some things. And this is a very interesting aspect. Most laws take years or decades to come up. So if you take the area of patient protection, most laws were written when you went to a doctor and the doctor had this folder with paper about you. And the law says to the doctor, you cannot make a Xerox copy or you cannot make a photocopy of the paper and make it public. You cannot send it to the insurance company. But it all refers to copying paper, not electronic copy. But now we're entering the era <coughs> of electronic health records, which are extremely important. You can have on one screen everything about a patient, the allergies, <coughs> all the documents that a patient has brought in, all the vaccination records, which additional vaccinations the patient needs, when is, uh, are they scheduled, what has been the way of the patient, does the patient have heart attack, are the parents of the patient liable for some diseases, who are the doctors that this patient is treated with, which are the medicines this patient takes. And if you have all this electronically in a database, when a new patient comes, if you have 20 million other patients that have had the same symptom, why not look in the database how those symptoms were treated and for which treatment, which were the results statistically, and maybe apply that to the new patient. We cannot do that because we have no laws yet protecting patient privacy electronically. And hospitals are very hesitant, medical doctors very hesitant in making the data public because there are no laws to protect. If we had the laws which we will have and they are coming, we could do evidence-based medicine. Look at what happened to other patients in similar circumstances. And by the way, on the lower part of this slide are those institutions which are more likely or most likely to start giving this data away. The other thing about medicine, that all laws were written based on the fact that patients and doctors were always meeting face to face. Most of you are young. You may not realize, but until 10 years ago, if you want to see a doctor, <coughs> you physically had to go and see the doctor or the doctor come and see you. All the laws and all the interactions were face to face. What happened when instead of that, this kind of device is going to be in hospitals. Kaiser Permanente has the same device that Eben is using now to permit doctors to visit dozens of patients. The doctor can be in your room now, leave your room from his office. He can activate another robot <coughs> and visit a patient in a completely different hospital. So a doctor can visit dozens of patients without having to move. Do patients like that? Yes, they do like that. Kaiser Permanente has discovered that patients love it because they can see the doctor much more often than if the doctor had to walk the hospital, then take a car and go to another hospital. Are there laws for robotic assistance? No, not yet. Are the laws that apply to face-to-face doctor-patient interaction, are they applicable to the new way of doing business? No, because there are new tools that may be liable for mistakes and they're not the doctor. Robots in hospitals are becoming very popular. People tend to accept them, but primarily children. Most hospitals for children now have some kind of robot delivering medicine. By the way, children often refuse to accept medicine from their parents, from nurses, or from doctors, but easily accept from a robot. <laughs> That's strange. Robots don't usually have human aspect. And many people say, what would happen if the doctor robot looked like a human? There are many experiments going on on geminoids, which are humans that look like their creator. Three of these people are humans, three are creation. There was a meeting of such people in Denmark. Can you imagine a Congress in which you go with your geminoid and participate? Not everybody was invited. For some reason, these two people who are identical, one of them is a robot, by the way, 
one of them was not, not, not invited. The other was invited, but we don't know which one. So, so it's very easy to start making robots that look like humans. I don't think that's the solution to have the acceptance of robots. In fact, it's too easy. You can go to the web. There is a very nice musical group in Japan called AKB48. AKB48. Some of you may know them. They're lovely girls that sing in a very animated way. In many of their videos, one or two of them are just robots. It's impossible to know which one. They all look alike. I know that sounds like a stereotype, and you're probably going to sue me, but for me, they all look alike. So you can create a robot. Now, robots can have other very good use, like exoskeletons. Exoskeletons are being built all over the world in Berkeley. This is the exoskeleton built at UC Berkeley that allows paraplegic people to start walking. It allows soldiers who are wounded to start walking. It allows soldiers who are not wounded to carry heavy payloads into the battlefield. So it's like a robot reinforcement of the human being. And fortunately, there are no laws that allow that to happen. Because if there is an accident, who's liable? The exoskeleton manufacturer, the programmer, the person who's using it? So we need to go into new forms of laws and regulations as we start going into new technologies. The most important one that we are missing, laws, is the Google self-driving car. Who, who here has not even heard of a Google self-driving car? Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand primarily because you are ashamed, but um, <laughs> Google has at least nine cars circulating in the Bay Area. They don't have a driver. They are self-driving cars. Is that allowed? Is that legal? The answer is no. In fact, it's not legal anywhere in the United States. So Google decided to make it legal to conduct experiments, which is the state which you go when you want to try to make something which is illegal become legal. You go to Nevada. <laughs> Sorry, uh, anyone from Nevada here? No. Good. Yeah, they have special permits on for California Highway. And in fact, the picture to the right is on 101. So, um, and they go to Berkeley too. So they have a special, per but they have escorts and all kinds of special provisions, but they don't have a driver. In fact, on the web, you can see a blind person driving a Google self-driving car. So Google, Google went in 2011 to Nevada and lobbied permission for self-driving cars. After one year, in 2012, last year, February, Nevada approved self-driving cars after Google lobbying push. By the way, the lobbying was very, very well done. They proved that self-driving cars were much, much, much safer than cars with drivers. And in fact, the nine cars of Google that have now over 700,000 miles accumulated in California streets and highways have never had an accident except for one in which a car rear-ended one of them. But really, they are very safe. They have all kinds of sensors and radars and so forth. So according to Jim Sporer, is Jim here? No. Jim Sporer thinks that this is going to be the future. I would love because I can hardly drive. So don't drive with me. Uh, I would love to have a self-driving car. But think of the dangers of a self-driving car. It looks very fancy, right? You call a taxi, it comes with no robot on the side. It looks very nice idea. But what is the danger of a self-driving car? What would happen if a hacker takes over your car? Where would you end? No, it's all computer controlled from a central place and so forth. And in fact, Google is not the one the only one doing self-driving cars. In Israel, Mobileye is now creating cars like this one, which can go on some roads and don't have a driver. Lexus is creating a self-driving car. This shows that there is a push towards creating cars that at least assist very heavily the driver, if not being self-driving. The Lexus will be self-driving. 
And of course, do not be behind IBM designed one. Pretty weird, isn't it? It was designed by the same people who designed safety features in our da database product. So <laughs> patching everything. But it's very safe. This picture, by the way, was taken in beautiful downtown Milpitas. Google is now beating in New York to have taxi cabs with no driver. And Mayor, Bro Mayor Bloomberg said yes, he's in favor if the New York legislature will allow it. So they will have self-driving taxi cabs. And as you can see on this lower picture to your left, there is a camera surrounded in a red circle in every Google car. It's more than a camera, it has radar and so forth. But the camera is constantly taking pictures as an assist to what's really happening in the road, which is automatic, but the camera knows if there's something extraordinary. So I want to know what do people think if they're crossing a street and coming directly at them is a car with no driver. So I finally hacked in the database of Google and found a picture of a typical pedestrian <laughs> as they see the self-driving car coming at them. Okay, if you have an idea and you think it's going to be the idea of the century, it better be very simple to express but cause a great effect. And that's the idea behind magic. In fact, magic is exactly that. Simple ideas, great results. Some of you are magicians, you know that. So I'm going to show you very quickly a magic trick in which the magician who's not a magician. Children can do that. You can do that. He's going to have two dollar bills cut, but in fact they are intact when he shows them to you. You're going to see someone cutting dollar bills. Watch the hands of the magician and see if you discover how this is done. About 30 seconds. Here's an interesting thing you can do with a couple dollars. Uh, they can be from any country. I'm going to use the United States dollar. What I'm going to ask my friend to do is to uh, choose any two dollars. Not the 20, please. <laughs> choose any two dollars that you want. All right, go ahead. Take another one. All right, examine those. Make sure there's no hidden compartments, no trap doors. All right. Regular dollar bill. All right, what I'm going to ask you to do is to take this pair of scissors and let me have the dollar bills. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that we have two dollar bills here. To George Washington, so as I said, you can use any currency. But we're going to take the two dollar bills right here, and we're very fairly going to place them together, just like this. Two dollars placed very fairly together. What I'm going to ask you to do, Melody, is to cut those in two. Just cut the two dollars in two, if you would. Go ahead. Now my question to you is, are these two dollars cut in two or not? Yeah, they're cut in half. Are you sure? Oh. <laughs> okay. Who knows how this was done? It's very simple. But it's the idea behind great ideas. They have to be very simple. In fact, if you look at Nobel laureates, many of their ideas are extremely simple. And I'm going to show you one in a while. How about the cloak on the invisibility that you saw, saw in Harry Potter movies? Is it possible to make a cloak, a coat, or a blanket that you put around you and it become invisible? It's actually not that difficult. The idea is very simple. Remember, great ideas have to be very simple, but they are great because somebody had them for the first time. Nobody else had them before. So it is how you make an object invisible. You use a very simple trick, which is not a trick, it's a phenomenon in physics. If you put a pencil in a glass of water, due to the different refractivity index of water and air, it looks as if the pencil is broken. It looks as if the light is coming from a different place for the pencil inside the water and from the part of the pencil outside the water. You have all done that, right? So it's not that bad. 
So why not do the same thing with an object? Suppose you could invent a coating that you put around an object so that it would curve light. A ray of light coming from the back would curve and continue here. An observer would see that this ray of light is exactly that one. So it seems that it's the light went through the object. So <coughs> it's very simple to make a cloak of invisibility. Just find something that curves light. So when you look at it, you see what's behind the object, which is where the light is coming from. And in fact, if you go to Berkeley, you can see that such a material was made. You have the impression, no, not the impression, you are seeing what's behind this person. The problem is that these materials that curve light are very difficult to find and very expensive, but not impossible. The homework, make your cell phones invisible. Piece of cake, right? Nobel Prize ideas are also very simple. These are two IBMers who got the Nobel Prize for this very simple instrument, the scanning tunnel microscope, which is a microscope that maps the surface at the atomic level of substances. So you slide a tip of a needle that has an atom at the bottom. You slide the tip, keeping the current constant. The current is proportional to the distance. So to keep the current constant, you have to go higher when there is an atom here. So this pencil is lifting when it is an atom. And in lifting, you can draw the contour of the atom. So this is a way of looking at atoms on a surface. If you keep, and here are two atoms mapped that way. IBM did more than that. If you keep the tip of the pen or the pencil close enough to the surface and do not lift it when you find an atom, the distance decreases and the tip attracts the atom and drags the atom. And by dragging atoms, IBM for the first time obtained the word IBM built with 35 xenon atoms which were dragged across the surface. This was done here in this lab, 50 yards from here. I said ideas are very simple. I didn't say the implementation is very simple. <laughs> this requires vacuum. This requires low temperature, vacuum, etc. So this lab, which is 50 yards from here, can drag atoms. Recently, about two months ago, they dragged atoms and took many pictures and using steel frame technology. They built a cartoon, which is called the world's smallest movie. They animated atoms, and this cartoon is called A Boy and His Atom. So let's go very quickly to the last item. I know I only have two minutes. We started at 2.07, it's 3.05. The last item is, it's very important if you have an idea to know exactly when that idea will be as its maximum impact or cause some impact. So the when question is crucial. For the when question, you have many possible ways of finding the answer. One is by law. So for example, in the United States, there is a law requiring that every car, truck, or bus working on gasoline must reach 55 miles per gallon by 2025. So if you have an idea on how to increase the number of miles that a car can get per gallon, if it's 55 or better miles per gallon, it has to be ready by 2025 because that will be the law. That, by the way, is equivalent to decreasing the price of gallons by one dollar with the mileage you are getting today. There is another way to do also the when, which is saying I have to follow a certain technological evolution. One of the questions that everybody asks themselves is when will computers be able to imitate the brain, to have the same computing power as the brain? There is a secondary question, very important. Computers, even today, use hundreds of thousands of watts. The brain uses only 
20 watts, like a little lamp, very weak lamp, because the brain is very smart. When it's doing nothing, it doesn't use any energy. When computers are doing nothing, it uses energy. By the way, when this room is doing nothing, when you all leave this room, hopefully in five minutes, the lights will go off. You know what? Electricity will continue to come to this room. It won't be used, but it will come, and there will be electricity losses in the cables. So humans don't know how to build systems like the brain, but we are getting there. In this lab, 50 yards from where we are down, we are mapping the brain and simulating the brain. We have done for the mouth. We have simulated the rat's brain. By the way, N is the number of neurons, and S, the synaptic connections. So how many synaptic connections there are? We have done a cat. In fact, we had the brain of a cat uh, pursuing the brain of a rat in a maze. And that's all computers that work like the brain. We have announced, 50 hours from here, that we have simulated the macaque brain, the form of monkey. And today, we are maybe at 2% of the human brain. The way in this is done is the following. You look at the brain of the macaque, the rat, the cat, or whatever, and you divide the cortex in small regions, and you see which regions are connected to each other region. And you map that in an image like this. In the circle, in the circumference, what you see are the regions of the cortex, and the lines means that regions are connected like they are in the real brain. So now you have a map of how the brain works, or a part of the brain, part of the cortex. By doing that, you can now create a chip in which each one of these cortex regions is like a transistor, and the connections are exactly like the connections of the brain. And IBM, in this lab, 50 yards from here, has produced the first brain chip already last year. Now we are producing much more powerful brain chips. In fact, 50 yards from here, downstairs, you can see a computer chip that mimics the human brain and learns about numbers without your having to teach. It's very hard to define what a number looks like, but it learns from experience because it works like the brain works. Oops. Okay, this means I have to speed up. Someone put that slide there. Must be Ray Cartwright. Yeah. Some things that I cannot forget to tell you. For the few of you who read the abstract of this presentation, there was a question. Is there a sex in your future? The answer to that question should now be obvious looking at those six, six aspects that you have to look at to see if there will be sex in your future? The answer is absolutely yes, if not by, for anything else, because it's really what people want. And that's what you've been having in mind during this whole talk. So it's time now for the most important slide, the one I'm sure you will not forget of this talk. So please try to remember. Talk is finally over. Thank you very much. I'll be here if someone wants to talk to me.